everyone joining from everywhere. If you just give me one moment, I will share some slides with you. There we go. Are we all okay to see those slides? Yep, yeah, see them. Perfect. In which case, let me say thank you once again for giving up your time to come and join me here today. You find me on a lovely sunny afternoon here in Istanbul. So today's question, I think, is quite a big question. Why and how should we make classrooms less heteronormative? And honestly, the why for me is really simple. The answer is because it's the right thing to do. But that would be a very short and probably boring webinar. So we're going to dive in a little bit more. Uh, before I get into it in earnest, though, I want to talk a little bit about the use of the word queer in this presentation. Uh, queer is how I self-identify, and I will be making reference to that term throughout this presentation, because a lot of the work I do grounds itself in queer theory, the idea that you can go beyond the normative. So while I know that it is not a term everyone in the LGBT plus community uses, it will come up in this presentation. And talking of that community, let's take a look at this quote. In 1981, Alex Hurst wrote a piece for the TEFL newsletter. And he noted, homosexuality does not exist in English-speaking countries. There's no AFL teachers in Britain or overseas who are not heterosexual. And of course, we know this is ridiculous. It was ridiculous 40 years ago, and it's absolutely ridiculous now. But that situation hasn't changed. When we look at the materials, we find that we're still having the same issues from so long ago. We're still asking the same questions. So why does it matter that there's no inclusion here? It matters because our learners need to see themselves in the materials. And quite frankly, so do teachers. There's that idea that you can't be what you can't see. But in this case, it's more of you can be it, but you still don't see it. ELT is not neutral. We go on as if ELT lives in a vacuum. Our books are very clean and sanitized. We get forced into this way of behaving by institutions and by the academy. It's what we call a socially sanctioned way. It's become the established order. Tamak Donofrio have this beautiful line that Bodies are disciplined in accordance with multiplicity with interlocking systems of power and privilege. And this is very true. We all know those people at the top of institutions are very powerful and very privileged. And unfortunately, those of us in the classrooms and the students in the classrooms, we don't necessarily have a voice and therefore we are expected to fall in line. But as educators, I think we have a duty to serve our learners' needs and to show them authenticity. So as much as ELT isn't neutral, neither are the students. Generation Z are filling our classrooms now, whether you teach K-12 or you teach at a university, unless you're only teaching senior adults, middle-aged adults, you're working with Generation Z. And a 2016 survey found that 50% of that generation are identifying as something other than heterosexual. And within that, a third of them identify as bisexual. So there is clearly a need for our learners to be able to see something that's non-traditional, let's say, within the materials. So why do I keep saying we're not talking about it? because of heteronormativity. So I want to show you here an example from Speak Out from Pearson. Speak Out in their second edition changed some of their original content. 
and they included a section towards the end of the book on Jack Munro. Here is Jack. They are an amazing poverty campaigner and food activist in the UK. And they rose to fame basically through a newspaper article talking about how it was to be a single mother struggling with no income. But you maybe notice I keep saying they, because Jack is non-binary and Jack uses they them pronouns. However, when we look at the content here that Pearson provided, it's all she. There's not even an option in there. And this is the photo they went with to represent Jack. Here's another photo of Jack from an interview with New Statesman in 2016. Same kind of time. You can see these are very different images. And one of those images will automatically be more recognizable to queer and gender diverse learners. In fact, this is what Jack had to say. This is the simple kind of content we could be putting in and discussing with our learners. Non-binary means outside the binary norms of male and female. It's somewhere in between. It's one of the many shades of society. I think this is really true because this speaks so much to that diversity that we have. And this would be such an easy inclusion for Pearson to make. It would take a simple find and search on this piece here to say, okay, all these she's are becoming they. And then we're representing someone's true identity and we're providing an example of diversity as well. Now, Pearson aren't the only people who do this. Um, OUP have also done this with Lecture Ready 3. They have a section when they talk about Keith Haring and his artwork, and they mention that his artwork was very unique and a very interesting development style. But what they don't mention is his sexuality or his AIDS activism or any of those things that made Haring a full person. So what we see is even when queer people make it into books, they're straight washed, they're sanitized for that heteronormative audience. So again, why? Because of heteronormativity. Heteronormativity is the idea that the one man, one woman relationship is the be all end all, it's the standard, it's the norm, and nothing deviates. And I'm very fond of this quote from Gus Yes that says, heteronormative thinking assumes the heterosexual experience is the human experience that there's nothing outside of that and yet does a lot of work talking about soul murder as well which really refers to the dehumanizing effect that happens when we aren't seen in our materials when we're constantly excluded Sweden to Switch has also followed on this idea we talked about how we are excluded as queer people because of our sexual citizenship. It doesn't give us an equal place in the community. And while we might agree that that's wider, uh, widely true, it's also true in the classroom because our classrooms are communities, they're communities of practice. They all have their own little microcosm of energy and ideas. So this pervasive heteronormativity means queer learners might never get to see themselves in the materials. And I know some of you are probably going to say, okay, we don't necessarily see person A, person B, person C. Yeah, you're right. There's a lot wrong. We need more people of colour. We need more people of different abilities and ages and illnesses all represented in the book. But let's focus with just one at a time. So in this case, when we see that we don't have people who look like us in terms of gender and sexuality in the book, we don't feel safe to come out. The average says, and has said for a very long time, that one in 10 people is gay. You think about your average classroom, if you've got maybe 30 students, you're gonna play the averages game, you've got three queer kids in there that are not seeing themselves. Multiply that by however many classrooms are at your institution over how many years you've taught. 
it adds up really quickly. We're talking about hundreds of thousands of people not seeing themselves. And that idea that we have to hide ourselves makes us so incredibly uncomfortable. Now, there's always the idea that people don't have to come out, but what about when you want to come out and you can't because you're not sure if you're safe or you maybe don't have the language to do that in a foreign language that you're learning. So the longer we continue not to deal with this issue, the more and more we marginalize those learners. We take agency away from them to represent themselves as their true and authentic selves. So in 2016, I also ran a survey. I did an anonymous survey to SurveyMonkey. And I asked for queer learners self-identified who studied English as a foreign language in Europe, the Middle East. And I had a few responses also from North Africa. These are some most interesting statistics I found when I ran those numbers. 90% of queer people didn't feel represented in the book. More than 66% said it was their sexuality that they didn't see. And just shy of 20% were saying their gender was not represented. So whether that's things like there's no non-binary characters, there's no trans characters, there's no agender or genderqueer characters, they're all missing. But the thing that kind of really hit home was this last statistic here. Just under 30% are reporting that they don't feel they would be supported they don't feel it would be safe to come out to their instructors so either their instructors weren't supportive or they wouldn't be in the cases of students who were in a closet and hadn't yet made their true identity known that's incredibly depressing but these numbers tell us one thing People want to be seen. We need to do better than this. We can't have such high amounts of people unrepresented in our books. So I said we're socialized into institutions and ways of behaviors. This plays into what I like to call academic drag. To say I could take credit for the naming of the phrase, but I actually can't. Um, Samek and Donna Frio coined this term in 2013, and they never specifically define it in their paper. It's more alluded to as what I have termed a polite avoidance of things we don't talk about, of things that might be those positive topics, you know, oh so delicious, but not the things we can talk about. Some of you might know the joke Thornbury once made that what's an ELP teacher's favorite vegetable? A parsnip, because they are the best topics really. But we're socialized into this drag and the reason we can call it drag is because it's performance. We're expected to perform in a certain way. Our institutions expect us to perform in a certain way. And we learn that in our undergrad programs, on our teacher training courses, when we go through master's programs, we learn it in staff orientations. And we know that we have to act in accordance with those rules, even if we think they're ridiculous and nonsensical. But even when we think that, the moment we start engaging with them, what we're doing is asking our learners to also engage with them, to fit that play. Because we're talking about a case where there's no material where they're represented, so what else are they going to do except go along with that established order? Because they see that's what's expected. And this is not to say the people who go along in this performance are malicious or quote unquote bad. It's sometimes simply the way in which we're forced into an institution. So we have this self censorship. We do it as educators, the learners do it as students. We don't know what punishment we're going to get for stepping out of line. Maybe because we don't quite know where the boundaries are and we don't know where the rules are. And maybe we'll be fine, but maybe we won't be. And for staff that might be, I don't know, a performance write-up. For students it might be 
ridicule, bullying, violence. It's very unpredictable and therefore we automatically censor. And this is um, another quote from Samet and Donofrio in the same paper. They say, we go on in heteronormative beliefs out of the name of professional development because we believe following the established order, not arguing, not questioning is the thing we're meant to do. It is the professional way to behave. I, uh, I'm here today to tell you nonsense. The professional way to behave, I would say, is the way which suits your learners. So we can queer the matrix. The matrix is an idea that comes from Judith Butler. And it's all about existing in the established order. Um, but De Palma and Atkinson looked at this and said, actually, the way to queer this, which I basically say is don't engage with it. Don't look at this established matrix and system. Just put it over there to one side. We don't need that. Okay. We can exist in it. We can do that lift service to it so it looks as if we're doing the things we need to do but we really don't need to follow the spirit of those rules right? we probably know when someone says go teach about family they mean there's a mom there's a dad there's 2.4 children oh i guess the average is probably more near to 1.7 these days but i'm sure you take the point but we can go off and we can teach family and we can teach queer families we can do that. Now I know there are concerns about where it is safe and is not safe to do that. And I'm absolutely not for a moment suggesting any of you put yourselves in harm's way in terms of physical and mental safety or job safety. But there are ways to work around it for sure. So let's go back to the why it matters, the meta consciousness. I want you to imagine a scene for a moment. You are sat in a classroom and you're watching a video as part of your language. Lesson. Many of you have had to do that. And there's a little story unfolding on the screen. And it's this lovely, happy, romantic love story by right? this couple going about their life. And you don't see yourself represented in that because you happen to date people of the same gender and that's an opposite gender couple on the screen. But somehow you're expected to use this lovely little narrative that's playing out to learn language and to talk about your own relationships. But how? That thing looks nothing like your lived reality. So what are you really meant to do with that? And it seems odd to say this but we do this time and time again in the materials so what we do while we do this with the materials and we put these little love stories in is we ask our students to run this meta consciousness where they have to think about whether or not they're safe to come out what can they let slip to who to when how can they take that language they're presented with and turn it around and utilize it Okay, so I say we do this time and time again. Let's take another look at a few materials. Uh, here are a couple of photo stills from Cambridge's Empower offering. Uh, these particular ones are from the A2 book. They use a lovely heterosexual relationship to do their conversational English. So every third or fourth section in the book, we get to meet the lovely Annie and the lovely Leo, who are perfectly pleasant people. Except they spend their time being perfectly pleasant or probably flirting with each other. And that's the context through which people are meant to learn their language. Oxford do the same thing. They have, quite frankly, a very problematic relationship they use with teaching their conversational and social language in their English bio series. And somehow we're meant to learn language through this relationship. But what we also learn when we're watching this is social coding. And that's the bit that, again, our queer learners are missing. 
Now, Oxford isn't all bad. Oxford got a little bit risky in their English file books in the latest editions. They managed to include Tinder. So we've got some up-to-date dating options. And they even managed to risk throwing in the word sexy. I know, could you imagine? However, we're still doing very normative dating, even on such flirtatious sites as Tinder. So these qualities for discussing men. They are tall, dark, and handsome. They're a gentleman. They have respectable jobs, like being a teacher. And this is just one of those things, it's like, we'll, we'll give you a bit of modernism. But still, let's keep the traditional values that go with it. You're still gonna look for an opposite gender partner with the same traditionally valued qualities and characteristics. Okay. So let's imagine someone goes through this, they learn these normative structures, but they decide they're going to come out in the classroom. And they talk about, as a woman, their girlfriend, or as a man, their boyfriend. We also hit this problem that Lydica outlined perfectly, that sometimes the teachers will assume the learner is making a mistake because it is not the phrasing they expected. So this is an example in Spanish, but Lydica's paper also talks about instances in Japanese and French, and I guarantee it's probably happened in your classroom at some point. You've had a student that comes out with the wrong word. But what if it's not the wrong word? What if it's just not the word that you expected? So in this example, Sam is trying to talk about his boyfriend. Now, the teacher asks a really normative question. What's your girlfriend like? And sometimes my boyfriend is tall and slim. And Spanish being a gendered language, he also genders it correctly. And then the teacher sort of goes, huh, mm -hmm, little head tilt and correct. But then we end up with this really awkward sentence. We end up with a boyfriend with feminine adjectives. And it isn't until Sam goes, no, no, my boyfriend has a beard, that the teacher finally corrects herself. Says, ah, what is your boyfriend like? Because to this teacher, it is far more logical and far more obvious in their world that Sam would be speaking the language incorrectly then he would be gay. And that floors me. I've been reading this article over and over again for the last four years. And this concept still floors me to imagine that we have people in language teaching professions who are so determined that they know more about student lives than students do, that they would assume so much heterosexuality over queerness and that the language had to be wrong. And again, this is not because people are bad and malicious. It's because we're all socialized into this normative way and into this standard way. And yes, while heterosexuality is the majority, it's not always the case. But because we're so focused on what's going on in the books, where that is what we're trying to deal, drill as languages, then we see these strange little corrections coming up. So how does this matter? Here we have Maslow's hierarchy. And I think we don't talk about this hierarchy enough. We spend a lot of time talking about bloom in language teaching, but we never get to hierarchies like this. Now I will say, I am also aware of the issues with Maslow leaning and perhaps let's say a stealing concepts from the Blackfoot Nation in order to create this hierarchy. Um, I have acknowledged that, but purely include it because I know it's the more familiar hierarchy of needs to most people. So although problematic for that accessibility aspect, I have decided to retain it here. So we know this hierarchy, we've got basic physiological needs and then safety and belonging and recognition. And these things all function in our language classrooms. Freedom from fear. Are they safe to come out? Because that survey says learners don't think they are. 
and they don't know because of the way they're socialized into the established order. So students don't know if they're safe when there's no inclusion. Friendship, how do you form a friendship and find belonging when you are not your true and authentic self? How are you recognized as the person you actually are when you're hiding part of yourself, when you're constructing a lie? And when you don't have any of those things, how do you reach your full potential? We all want our learners to go through our classrooms and be the best they can be and go on and reach their dreams and their targets. But if they're not safe to be their true authentic selves, they're not going to get there. What's going to happen is they're going to become insular and isolated and we lose them as learners. And if we're really unlucky, we lose them as people. And this is why I keep coming back to, it's the right thing to do. And yes, as a queer person, I absolutely have a vested interest. I will never deny that. But I also know that not talking about it isn't going to change anything because I went through a school system where we couldn't talk about gay things and definitely didn't make me straight, definitely didn't change who I am as a person. So why not give people the language to fully actualize themselves and show who they are? And this is another example of why it's so important. There's a quote from an academic from 2019. My first week in a new job, Queer non-binary students are so excited about a prof who uses they them pronouns. One on a four flights of stairs to catch me in my classroom and said, I don't have a topic. I just wanted to talk. I've been waiting four years for you. Four years. In the US, that's an entire degree. In the UK, you finished your degree in three. Going through all that time, not seeing anyone who looks like you in the academy, in your classrooms. And this is a simple thing as just someone with an alternative pronoun. Our students are crying out for us to be authentic and to be able to be their authentic selves. So let's get to the how, because I'm sure this theory is all well and good, but you would like something practical. I've got six key ideas here that I think are things we can all do to some extent. So the first thing starts with us. We have to examine our prejudices, challenge normative ideas. Think about the ideas that you're carrying with yourself into that classroom. What do you believe to be true about various gender identities, about different sexualities? Get to the root of why that's what you think. And if it's something where you go, hmm, I don't know, that's fine. No one knows anything until they know it, right? There are plenty of resources out there and I'm more than happy to share those if you reach out to me as well. But examine what you're thinking and then challenge those normative ideas in your classroom as well, right? If someone's coming out with, oh, well, this is a man and therefore their partner must be a woman, why? Asking that simple why question, we all know we love the question why in classes, is really easy to do. And while we're challenging things, challenge offensive language. Make it clear to your students that there is no place for it in your classroom. Get your institution to say there's no place for it in your language school, in your department. Okay? And it's as simple as, uh, no, we're not going to be called things that we think are ridiculous and silly or gay. Okay. Some of you will be old enough to remember when that was a real big thing. We won't be having any of that, thank you very much. We won't be using it as an insult, we won't be calling people any variation of any of the gender and sexuality slurs in any language, first, second, third, fourth, target language or not. We won't have that in this classroom. And be consistent. The only way to do this is to be consistent. But schools work that have piloted consistent anti-bullying policies where they target language and have no tolerance policies see consistent results in reduction of bullying. Now the next two I think go together very nicely. 
avoiding debating student identities and avoiding tokenizing people. So we love a debate class, I'm sure. I'm a big fan of debate classes. They're some of the best lessons I ever teach. But people's right to exist is not a topic for discussion. So maybe you want to challenge with a topic about should gay marriage exist? Maybe. Should gay people exist? Absolutely not. People's right to exist and to be and to be safe and secure is not a debatable matter. I and mean, your students will absolutely have opinions on why maybe people shouldn't be out or why they think it's wrong or bad. And sadly, we can't really change what some people think. But what we can do is make sure we're not debating it in the classroom so that people aren't exposed to those harmful ideas. But at the same time, don't just shove a random gay person into your materials as an afterthought. If you want to build in inclusivity and diversity, build it in from the beginning. Don't make a material and then go, oh, this is all cis, het, able-bodied white people. Let's shove in this person. I'm going to pretend this person is a lesbian. No, like tacking things on for the sake of tacking it on does not work. Because one, you're not going to have any confidence in the content you're delivering about it. And two, everyone's going to know it's an afterthought. And when they know it's an afterthought, they know it doesn't really matter to you. So how do we get real bait inclusion? Listen to your students. If you have students who are out, you can ask them what they want. But even more importantly, listen to students who are starting to tell you things that may be out them in the classroom. Listen for those things where you have men saying boyfriend, or you have people saying partner of no gender, where people code the people they talk about with they, them pronouns. Listen to those, hear what your students are saying, mirror that language back to them. It's simple and it's small. Because that's the great thing about this is none of it is difficult. We can all begin right where we are right now, tomorrow morning, this evening in our classes. We can all carry these changes with us. And the other thing to do is to queer materials or re-queer them. I thought about Jack Monroe and Keith Haring. You can find the extra content about those people and bring it in. You can edit that article from Pearson and say, actually, we're going to talk about Jack, but we're going to use they, them pronouns and make it a little more authentic. It's a five minute change on the board. It's super quick, but it gets nearer to the truth. It socializes the learners to know, huh, here's a new way to talk about people. Here's the thing that some people use. I have a few resources that might help with some of these as well. So, genderbred people. This is actually a great resource if any of you are doing um, PHSE style classes along with your language teaching. Uh, the genderbred person talks about all the ways we can combine our gender, our sex, our sexuality, our gender presentation. If you want to look at language in the classroom, you can look, take a look at Kristen's Think Before You Speak campaign. They ran a very large TV and print media campaign a few years ago, talking about the impact of phrases like, that's so gay. And their educator's guide is free to download. Uh, if you want ready-made, ready to go, diverse and inclusive materials, I would suggest you take a look at Peter Fulger's website. He has some wonderful materials that are inclusive for sexuality and gender and also other issues. Or if you want to write your own inclusive material, take a quick look at Titan Seaburn's book, How to Write Inclusive Materials. It published last year. Um, it's available through Amazon. It's not necessarily widely available to other sellers um, but it's a very accessible book that will guide you through that process 
So let me show you one more activity I do. I have picked three lovely people here. I often do this exercise with students where I give them some photos, just photos, no content, no names. And I ask them to write down their assumptions about people. So these are three people I've used. They don't all have to be famous. They don't all have to be queer. I just thought we'd have the queer ones for this presentation. And then you can have them present their assumptions and the why they think it. Um, now, these people I chose particularly when I did this activity because James Baldwin spent time here in Istanbul. So he's always a great one to talk about. I include Jack because Jack's already in the materials we've worked with. I include Leslie Feinberg because Z uses neo pronouns. And neo pronouns are not a thing we get a chance to talk about but you can introduce them in that way. Now to do this, of course, you have to make sure you have a safe space and this works well with small intimate kind of groups as well, where people are safe to make assumptions and where you trust that there's not gonna be any problematic, shall we say, explanations. But I find that works well and then you get to talk about the actual life story of these people. And you don't have to do as a class activity with multiple people. You can do it with one photo as a whole class. And you can choose non-queer people as well and photos from your own life. It's something that makes the students think about what they believe and why they believe it. And I find it's generally a really fun activity, especially if you have something like this photo of Baldwin where you've got a background as well to get some more context clues. So the final thoughts. Why does this matter? Because language isn't about just vocabulary and grammar structures. It's about giving learners a voice, literally and metaphorically. It's about giving them a way to thrive as their true authentic self. And until we include necessary vocabulary, until we move away from the normative, they're never going to get there. We have to start meeting learners where they are. And for some learners, for some educators also, that's a really queer place. That's the framework they work within. And honestly, for some of them, maybe that's just the language they need to also realize it for themselves. But ultimately, the publishers are not gonna instantly get there. Yes, there are people working on it. Pearson are doing a great push on equality on their staff side, but they're still not getting it into their book. And while I do commend their work with the staff, it's not really going to serve our learners, which means we have to step up. We have to look at querying our materials about checking our own prejudices, about paying other teachers who've made these excellent materials so we can use them. But somehow we've got to do the work. And if everything I've had to say doesn't work, I'm going to leave the very final words to a student from my survey. Having gay and lesbian couples dating and holding hands would be a big step forward in changing the normative perception on LGBTI plus individuals on such an important time when both bias and gender identities are shaped. And that, my colleagues, that reason from the student is exactly why we need to do better with these materials and why I really hope you'll take up the challenge to start querying your material. And just to finish the quick list of references, thank you very, very much for your time. I hope you found this at least interesting, if maybe not necessarily completely helpful. Thank you. Thanks, Elizabeth. Well, yes, I found it very interesting and useful. Um, so thanks for that. Really, really good. And thank you also for um, everyone who's been putting comments into the chat. Lots of, I don't know, I imagine, Elizabeth, you've probably not been able I to. I haven't had the chance to see them, but I've seen the count number yeah. going up. And I'm so curious. <laughs> There's lots of interesting, yeah, lots of interesting discussion and great and, and very positive. Um, yeah, no, very interesting. And, and, and thank you. Um, just as I, as I said before, I was sort of keeping an eye on Facebook and everything, so I wasn't able to fully 100% um, 
pay attention, which is a shame. But I will watch the recording back. Um, but yeah, I just wanted to, I just needed to keep an eye on some of the chat on Facebook and also what's going on here in Zoom. But um, questions, if you do have questions for Elizabeth, please do put those into the Q&A. Uh, there's one here oh. from Janet. Hi, Janet. <laughs> uh, what are the possible pedagogies that can tackle heteronormativity in the classroom. Um, while you're thinking, I don't know if you want to kind of jump <laughs> straight into that one. Okay, uh, that's a naming question. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, it's kind of, yeah, what you've been yeah, talking about. Yeah, I think the pedagogy is that which we create ourselves, to be honest. I don't think we can transplant any existing theory to completely deal with this. I would say this is more praxis than pedagogy. It's about more practice than theory. Okay. Yeah. Okay. I did see a sneaky question in the chat, but then I lost it. Uh, 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 I'm just having a look. Yeah, wow. if you've got, if, if you, if that's you, if you wrote a question in I the- I found one here from uh, Karina. I have a question. Of course, there is not common. Many languages do not have a word like that. But for teaching dear sir or madam, any experience? Uh, go with to whom it may concern, if you're doing a good formal letter. Or dear job title, if you want to avoid that. Um, yeah, they is a tricky one. I know a lot of languages don't have any version like that. Um, but yeah, one way to make they easy is if you're doing telephone English. Someone's on the phone. Ah, what do they want? That's the most common way we see it. And once they've got that use, you can spiral it out. Right? Oh, oh, I saw a funny clown in the street yesterday. Oh, what did they look like? Use little simple things like that, and then you can work on to build it into things like formal writing. Mm -hmm. But honestly, yeah, dear job title or to whom it may concern, if you want to give them mutual options, great workarounds. There was, there was a comment earlier on. Um, yeah, see what you think of this one. All right. <laughs> so heteronormativity cannot be considered a problem everywhere and generalised to all places. Cultures differ. Um, how, how would you respond? Actually, cultures differ. That does not make it not a problem. Hmm. Yeah. That's what I kind of thought. Yeah. I just sort of wondered. I'm aware that's a very blunt answer. Um, and of course, there's a way to work things within your culture. I mean, every culture is heteronormative, I would say. Mm -hmm. That's why it's more, more yeah. important that we look at working beyond it. And when we start small, you will know in your teaching context and in your culture what the easiest way to start with this is. Mm -hmm. But just because it's predominantly heteronormative, I guarantee you there's still going to be queer people in your country. Yeah, that's, yeah, that's what I was kind of thinking as well. I mean, just, yeah. yeah. Is it is it is it a cultural thing? I mean, I don't, I, I yeah. don't think it. I don't know if it is. I, I don't know. I mean, it's, I don't think it is. Comment here as well. Michael Angelo de Jesus has made a great comment. Uh, the gender neutral use of mix for those who don't use Mister, Mrs, Ms. Yes. Mm -hmm. Michael, thank you so much. Yes. In fact, going back to Jack Monroe, that is also what they use. That's a great shout, Michael. Thank you. Okay. Um, so one thing I wanted to ask you, obviously, uh, there's the, yeah, well, there's a couple of things. First one was around publishers, um, and I'll come back to that. But um, I mean, looking at, at cultures, or maybe not cultures, but countries where, for example, um, the law, you know, is, is, is you know, is, is different, obviously, in different countries. In some, in some countries, obviously, homosexuality is um, illegal, for example. Um, how how would you deal with that or what recommend i mean i'm sure you've been asked this question lots of times but just sort of recommendations on how to where it's illegal to be gay it's a bigger problem yeah um or in cases like this ridiculous bill in florida with the don't say gay which is similar to what yeah. we have section 28 in the uk and you can't really talk about it mm -hmm. um firstly don't break the law i'm not trying to get any of you arrested or worse um, but I would say you can still be supportive of your learners if they come out. You can still, in your classroom, create 
a nice community where if they happen to mention something, they know they're safe. Mm-hmm. And you can inform the other students. And I saw there's a question about religion as well. Religion is a personal mm-hmm. matter. Everyone's going to believe what they want to believe. But as long as you're not using your religion to shame somebody else. And I think yeah. that's how you have to make your classroom environment. Mm-hmm. Okay, super, you believe homosexuality is against God. I can't change your opinion. However, we are not going to harm people in this classroom if they are homosexual. Mm-hmm. And I think that's the only way you can deal with it in that way. Mm-hmm. Okay. Um, I've lost my thread now. I was going to say something and I've completely, it's completely gone. <laughs> uh, okay, yeah, it was sort of, a, well, not really a question, it was more comment. I mean, you, when you showed the Maslow's hierarchy there and, and you had, sort of, you know, safe, safety is, you know, they're kind of, it, it's, it's a huge one. Um, so what you're kind of, talking about there's that there's that kind of safety there's that sort of sense of you know a student coming in to the classroom and feeling yeah and, and feeling that um did, have you had have you had i mean have you had any sort of major challenges where you've kind of um kind of addressed certain things or you've dealt with certain topics or things and students have just really not not kind of responded well to it um, um terribly badly I did have discussion a few years ago with a class I got on very well with but there were some very um what in the UK we'd call laddish lads mm-hmm. they was very like hyper masculine slightly toxic masculinity kind mm-hmm. of characters who could be kind of endearing but also problematic <laughs> and um I happened to yeah. mention I'd been to see a film at the weekend that was about coming out stories and um well, you know, oh, one of those chats, and like, oh, Jim, what? No, oh, Jim, this is not normal. Excuse me, okay. it's not. No, men should not date men. It is not normal. So that, that became a bit of a, generally, they're mostly okay. And we've, at my institution, had a few queer students over the years, and they've not, to my knowledge, encountered any problems, even though we are quite a conservative institution here. Right. Um, generally, the really younger generation, it's a little more supportive. Yeah. Okay. I was going to say yeah, because obviously you know where you're based and where you're working, it's it's sort of perhaps goes against the not the grain, but it goes against the sort of the, I suppose policies or goes. Yeah. And there wrong. are absolutely issues here in Istanbul and Turkey. Just I think at yeah. the particular institution, we've been very lucky in that mm-hmm. regard. Okay. Um, okay. Sorry, I've got my own questions, but I'm actually <laughs> <laughs> look look at the uh, yeah. Uh, the questions, uh, okay, a place like Florida, okay, yeah, that's interesting. Um, there's some about videos, uh, teachers should also minimize or avoid the use of educational videos that are heteronormative, uh, okay. I mean, I think where you can, yes, definitely. If there's a way to teach that language without using like an unnecessarily heteronormative video absolutely use that alternative hmm. and i mean um okay yeah publishers um and materials you sort of showed the examples there as as, as sort of weak-ish as they were with uh, with pearson making some, some kind of vague attempt i just uh, just do you see that as something that will become more common that the that publishers will start to address some of the issues in course books and if so is it is it going to be constructive to have a unit you know you've got the unit which is environment unit which is you know to have a unit on sexuality or a unit on i mean there uh, are some books from yeah. a little mm. more diverse and inclusive publishers that are going that way um, right. but it right. doesn't need to be a separate unit it can be yeah <laughs> And yeah. I think that's the thing, that's when we know we've really got there, when it's mixing, it's like, oh yeah, Bob is dating David instead of Bob is dating Sarah. Like, yeah. okay, great. Hi, Bob and David. Like, yeah. those simple little changes where yeah. it just, eh, this exists. Okay. Yeah, yeah, that's what I was sort of thinking and about. I think they yeah. will get there. I did have um, a word with Pearson briefly about this, their head of uh, HR. He looked a bit alarmed, but I said, can you please stop straight watching your material? But I think they'll get there. I think we just have to keep nagging them and pushing them. 
Okay. A little what did bit. they What did they say when you said can you? Uh, it was actually at a diverse educators event, and he was a bit startled. <laughs> right. I like startling people though. He's like, it's like, oh, sometimes you need a shock to the system to make you think about it. Well, yeah, there needs to be yeah challenge to yeah. Have, <laughs> challenges it, then you know, then it just perpetuates, oh. isn't it? Um, yeah. I just, just... Want to pull up on a comment that came up in the question here from. Mm -hmm. That was not a sentence. <laughs> a question that came up in the chat here from Marlene. In my school, there's a student who doesn't want to be called by her name. She prefers a non-binary name. The teachers are against her mother addressing the teacher. Should we call her by the name she chose and respect her? Yes, absolutely. Of course you should. Yeah. Um, when you say her mother addressed the teacher, I'm going to assume, Marlene, that you mean the mom supported her child? Um, I would hope so. Even in test, she writes a different name from hers. Unless it's a national exam where she's getting a certificate, I wouldn't worry about it. It might be that they want to get the name changed, but she's not of an appropriate age yet. Mm. That's mm -hmm. fine. And even if it's an exam where she has to write a dead name or a name she doesn't use, then, okay, that's going to be slightly uncomfortable. Mm. But there's no need to call a person by their name. That they don't use. We call people by nicknames and pet names all the time. Like when no. it's trans and non binary people, the fact that we say, oh no, this is on your ID, this is on your birth certificate, you can't be called anything else, is nothing short of prejudice. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. Great. Um, anything else? Any other questions? Just to say thank you, Tyson, for coming along as well, because obviously, Elizabeth, you showed. Uh, Tyson's excellent book in the list of resources and Tyson's here so uh, welcome oh hello thanks Tyson. for joining us <laughs> uh, and, so many people yes. have no idea who's here <laughs> lots of people there's lots of people here everyone's here <laughs> um just to say finally because a couple of people have said oh can you put the link to the certificate in the chat so I kind of have done that it is in the chat as I said at the start of the webinar which some of you might not have joined um right from the start if you're watching on a mobile device or phone or a tablet, then I don't think you can click any links. But uh, as I said, the um, survey will pop up on your screen, hopefully after the webinar. Uh, if you complete the survey, then at the end of that, there's a link to the certificate and instructions. If that doesn't happen, um, don't panic again, um, because you will get an email tomorrow. Um, and in that email, it will say, this is the certificate link, and this is how you get it, and this is what you need to do. So, um, so don't, no, no one's going to be panicking, are they? I say don't panic. I mean, you know, it's, it would be unusual to assume that someone would actually seriously panic about not getting a certificate, but you never know. Um, Okay, we've got time for a couple more questions. If anyone has any, uh, there's a few things about pronouns. Uh, I think the teaching of pronouns. Okay, from Chaz, teaching of pronouns is a change we can all make from tomorrow, can't we, Elizabeth? Absolutely. <laughs> okay, there we go. <laughs> it's important. Even add in one extra sentence. She likes milk. He likes apples. Mm. They like bananas. There we go. Job done. Yeah. Really, like they them pronouns, I think is maybe the easiest way to start with this kind of inclusion. Mm. And I mean, maybe let's say, oh, it's confusing because we know they them as pronouns. Pictures, draw a little stick figure. It's fine. Yeah. They'll see this one stick figure, they them. Learners are smart, they'll match those ideas. Mm. That's the other thing. We need to really have faith in our learners that they're going to get this and that they're interested yeah. in it. I guess, I mean, as well, you know, obviously as, as, as teachers, what we tend to do is, is you know, we look, well, I, I think anyway, as teachers, what we do is we look at the material in the course book and go, oh, God, um, and then go off and look for something different. So, you know, in that search for something different, as, as you kind of, you know, you show with the, with the biographies there and also with um, Keith Haring and um, so on. So it, it's, it's a question of maybe having that in the back of your head, like, you know, do I need to go and look for an alternative example, which is reinforcing sort of heteronormativity, or can I go and find an example which is kind of you know something slightly different and just sort of slowly bringing that and feeding that into your lesson as as as, as, a, as you know a normal and course. The great of... thing about material is once you have them, you mm. can use them again next year if you're doing the same books. Yeah, 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 exactly, exactly, and share them with other teachers. So yeah. that it's sort of. And that's the thing you can always say, you know, oh, we have to do this book if you want five, six of you that are interested to say, okay, well, I'll do this exercise, you do that, mm -hmm. then we'll all swap and share. Mm -hmm. Yeah, no, no, exactly. Brilliant. Um, 
Elizabeth, we sort of run out of time. Uh, I think we've covered most of the questions that were in the Q and A. Uh, Twinkle, someone who said has got some inclusive oh, materials for kids on pronouns, uh, which is good. I'm just actually going to, before we stage, drop my email in the chat box, and then if anyone has any questions or follow-ups, they can drop me a line. Great. She's doing her awkward talking and typing voice. Yeah. <laughs> if you want to do that, then. <laughs> <laughs> okay. After three years online, we'd all be over that. Time. <laughs> yeah, no. All right. Um, okay. So there's Elizabeth's email if you want to get in touch. Um, thank you, everyone, for joining us. Thank you for a really interesting kind of chat. It's uh, yeah. Some, sometimes it's lots of hellos and then not much else. But this this has been a hugely constructive conversation. I think in the chat. So brilliant. And thank you to Elizabeth for. Um, for kind of as I say, for causing that that sounds wrong for making that happen but um really thank you for actually reaching out to me Paul and asking me to come and do no, that you're welcome no no um thank you um right that's all we've got time for thanks ever so much for coming everyone thank you again Elizabeth uh as I say all links and everything certificates and so on will be emailed to you tomorrow and um and we will also be making the slides and the recording available um be tomorrow so um, if you want to watch anything back or you want the slides or version of the slides they'll be available tomorrow um so yeah brilliant thanks elizabeth uh and hopefully we'll, we'll have you back again soon anytime to that. brilliant thanks everyone take care have a good afternoon or evening or morning or whatever and see you again bye